Hey guys, welcome to the CPD Junkie podcast where we bring you interviews with dentists sharing their CPD stories and journeys from around Australia. What better way to learn than to follow those who've already done it before? CPD Junkie is Australia's most comprehensive CPD, so head over to cpdjunkie.com.au and become a member for free to access the full features of the site. I'm your host, Lawrence Stone, and today we're joined by Dr. Mohit Talini. Mohit graduated as a dentist from Griffith University, Gold Coast, and more recently completed a double degree of Masters of Public Health and a Master of Health Management from UNSW, and also a certificate, a graduate certificate in Health and Medical Leadership from the University of Wollongong. After finishing his dental education, Mohit worked as a hospital dental surgeon at Griffith Goulburn Valley Health Hospital in Shepparton, rural Victoria, gaining a myriad of dental clinical experiences, enjoying all aspects of general dentistry. Dr. Mohit Tahani, welcome to the show. Thank you, Lawrence. So, Very comprehensive. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us what your CPD or dental journey has been so far and what has led you on to um, complete a double degree of Master of Public Health and Master of Health Management from UNSW. Thank you, Lawrence. For me, I think the starting point was when I was doing my undergrad degree in medical sciences with honors. And that's when I was doing research and I was trying to work out um, where should I head with my skill and my skill set. So I used to attend seminars at Sydney University then. And that time I wasn't a dental or a medical student. I was just in medical sciences and I was trying to explore my pathways. And then I came across, I, I started attending these research seminars by the Faculty of Medicine then and the Faculty of Dentistry. And I thought, well, trying to analyze my own skill set, something to something which I like to do is to talk, to do things with my hands and I like health. Well, what's gonna be the perfect balance for me? And I think I put it down on a skill sheet and consulted my mentor who's still based at Sydney University. And basically I embarked on my dental journey and I moved back to the Gold Coast because that's where I originally came from. Finished my dental degree and during the dental degree, I gained a myriad of experiences. Now worked with you on as part of the Australian Dental Student Association as well. And I think through that and through the other networks which I gained, I think I was speaking with a lot of specialists and mentors who I met across various facets of dentistry. So when I was trying to channel my interest as in, yes, I like dentistry, now what? I like my clinical dentistry, now what do I do after that? So I was trying to work out, yes, I like advocacy, I like to do things with my hands. I like to uh, nut down and work out the base of the problem. Now, it may not just be clinical problems. It may be psychosocial problems. It may be problems in the community. So I embarked on the community service side of things. And I thought, well, I'm not a rich man, but I'm rich with my skills in dentistry. Why not <laughs> deliver those via that? So I think with the help of Griffith University and the Road Track Club of Southport that I was part of then, we embarked on charity projects. Now, when I was doing these projects, I, I said, well, yes, I've got the clinical background in dentistry and I've got the now firsthand experience in pro bono project projects on a small scale. I need to put theory to this. I need to cement all my experiences. So as soon as I finished my dental degree in 2016, I was embarking on a journey in Master of Public Health and I thought I'll combine it with Master of Health Management. Now, I did that at University of New South Wales because they were very flexible with the program and the pace that I wanted to lead. And given that my interest was working with um, a diverse group of people and the subjects that I chose, they were focused on a wide range of aspects, not just pure clinical side of things, but obviously managerial side of things, leadership, uh, clinical governance and all that sort of stuff. I think that intrigued me. And the birth of that was through CPD during my dental school when I used to attend CPDs after, after hours when they used to have it and even speak to different mentors. Now, it may not be a formal form of CPD. It was through consulting with different health executive bodies out there. So I think I engaged myself with that because I sort of was interested and I sort of was learning through that with the Dental Student Association involved. So I thought, well, if I'm taking the next step forward, I'm going actually in the community firsthand without any support, I may as well have the theory experience. So I think Master of Public Health was very good and Master of Health Manager was very good. Now, when I worked in Victoria, I was still studying and I was still doing my first job as a dental officer at Golden Valley Health in Shepparton. And I think best decision of my life was to go away from where somewhere didn't, who didn't know me, where I had no idea what the town was. It's rural, regional, away from all my friends and family. 
and obviously start from the scratch and make mistakes and learn from those mistakes and have a mentor as well. So I had a clinical mentor there who was my boss as well. And at the same time, I could engage in the projects that I wanted to get engaged in, in a regional setting, because I could see there was a big disparity between urban health, urban dental health and regional and rural dental health. So I think we engage in projects there. So I think having that CPD experience and having that mentor experience at university followed through to my work experience as well in a regional public hospital with the theory background, which I was studying, I think that actually painted a good canvas for me to engage in the career that I'm in. So I think that's what motivated me to the, do that degree is to give me that extra edge on top of the clinical side of dental world. Mm. And then more recently, you did the uh, graduate certificate in health and medical leadership from University of Wollongong. Tell us about that. So that was more so tailored because I'm working. So after I finished my journey at Golden Valley Health, my wife was expecting, so we moved back to Sydney. But I still had a part for like working in regional rural areas with certain flexibility. So I think the fact that my wife was about to start work and also deliver a baby and I wanted a flexible work, work life schedule. I found a job in Dapto, which is regional New South Wales. Coincidentally, you work there as well <laughs> <laughs> in the same suburb. Um, point is, the workplace was very accommodating of my needs and the projects and the initiatives that I wanted to be part of. So when I was doing, I was working in a private practice now, but obviously I wanted to have a different style of private practice model. And that included seeing more public dental patients as well, trying to be an advocate in the community. So it's not just for the public dental side things of things. So not just for the local health district, but you obviously as an advocate for the whole dental fraternity, despite working in the private dental industry, given the fact that there's 85% of dentists working in the private dental sector, as opposed to the public dental sector, I think both the sectors have an important role in advocacy. So I thought, well, now that I've got my public dental background, I've got a theory background and I've also got clinical experience and I've got firsthand experience in the public dental side of things and private dental side of things, how do I bolster that experience with something local? So that's why I undertook the graduate certificate in medical and health leadership just to, and I took the subjects which were slightly different from my previous masters, only to focus on how we could bridge the gap between the private and public sectors. And that's why um, that was the best course I think I did. And it was during the first lockdown and the first pandemic, which was last year, well, same pandemic, but the first lockdown phase. And I think that was really good. Um, so having something local, trying to apply something on the grassroots level was quite noteworthy. And I think that's where the University of Wollongong came in very handy. Mm. And how did you find these courses? Did you go online at the different universities and what ended up making you select these ones? So I have a weird habit of Googling things. <laughs> and so literally I was searching, I was, I was looking around the fact that now I want to enhance this skill of mine. So what do I do? So my skill was, I think the, the skill which I wanted to enhance was emotional intelligence with respect to health. Because everyone says you've got to be emotional, you've got to think about from a patient's perspective. Well, there was no CPD for that. So I thought, well, what's the best way to engage in learning? So this course had that sort of subject, which had emotional intelligence for leaders or something of the world. And it was part of this course. So I said, I may as well do the course. And, it was, and I thought, I'll, instead of choosing subjects, which I've done previously, I'll do something, di something different. And I did those subjects, basically. So kind of complementing the previous studies that I had. So I think that's what sort of gravitated me towards it. So pure, simple Google, actually. And that's the link that came up. Because I think there's a lot of courses which are going out there at the moment. And people get confused as to which journey to take, especially with dental public health and focus. Um, not many people know that there are courses in CPD for that as well, and that there is seminars and webinars being done because they're not maybe they're not that well publicized but i think given the fact that i'm part of various linkedin groups and various facebook groups which actually put off these seminars and webinars I, I do come across those and i do attend them regularly but i think from a clinical course point of view um i went with simple google and that's how i found the course Mm. And so, you know, like you've mentioned, um, it's, it's, you went online and you did all this Googling, but as you also mentioned, public health dentistry isn't very well talked about or very vastly talked about amongst a lot of dentists, you know, were these courses what you expected? Because a lot of times people can talk to other people that have gone through the courses to kind of get and then decide, okay, actually that sounds like a, what I wanted to do. But did you find what these courses were what you expected and hoped you wanted to get out of? 
Well, the way I approached it, if I'm investing time and money, and especially from my uh, personal and professional life, I usually contact the convener or whoever's running the course. And I usually ask them, like, what are the contact hours or what's the requirement and what sort of material would you cover just to get a preload. Now, that half an hour, 45 minute, one hour conversation, whatever that is, I think will give you a good brainstorm of what the session is going to be like. So I usually try and do the grilling session because if I'm rewarding time for CPD, I don't want it to be any any CPD. I want it, I want it to be CPD that applies to me in this point of time. So that's what I did with this course and it was fantastic. So I think with the public health background, health management background and this certificate in medical, grad certificate in medical and health leadership, I think it sort of surmounted all the knowledge and experience that I had um, to a more local context. So from an overarching context to a local context, and that's been quite useful, I feel, and certainly beneficial to where one might tragic free to hit. Mm. Yeah, I like how you, you approached it like that. Um, so just back onto when you're graduating, you're actually um, into the graduate program of the Goulburn Valley Health Program. Now, for a lot of Victorian dental students, you know, that might be well known, but you're from, you know, you're graduating from Queensland. Um, how did you find out about this and what made you pick this program? I actually, when I was doing research for applications and stuff and where do I go for a graduate program, my criteria was going public and going rural because I think I wanted to, you know, um, bolster the skills that I've got be it in extractions, pain diagnosis, uh, working with various kinds of people, because I think that's the best time you can actually apply your uni knowledge into practicality. So when I was Googling, once again, I actually was coming across various programs and I'm like, well, okay, this makes sense, this makes sense, but how do I nut it down? So I basically went on where public dental websites where they had a graduate program or where they did take in dental officer level one, you know, those are jobs. So there was Queensland Health, there was New South Wales Health, had a couple of opportunities. Um, there was one in Victoria. And I was like, well, I've lived in Sydney. I've lived on the Gold Coast most of my life. So I thought, well, why not go to a different state? And amongst all the jobs in Victoria that were there, this stood out to me because it actually said, you have a mentor. And the, I, I think what they indirectly indicated was the fact that there are no, there's no specialist help in the hospital, which means you're forced to do treatments by yourself. And you've got Kelly uh, Dentistry Connect with the, the Royal Dental Hospital of Melbourne. And I think you can use utilize that facility and the mentor is there as well. So I thought, well, if I want to challenge myself, I'm going all out. So why not? <laughs> so I think, I think that's, how, that's why I picked this job because particularly it was uh, far away from what I was aware of. And I thought it would be challenging for me and probably um, without any sort of specialist help available hands on, despite the fact that I had a mentor, I think um, I think it was a good combination for me, I thought, just to grow and do things differently and still in a protective and protected environment. So I think that's why I took that job. The other aspect of this was the job, which I thought was very good, was the fact that they had a very limited intake of students. So as you said, they, it's more popular with the Victorian students, not with any outsiders. So I think even when I applied, it was a bit of a, I wouldn't say shock, but they were like, well, why are you applying here? <laughs> and, I, and I, and the answer I'm giving you now is the answer I gave it to them then as well. And I just said, I just want to challenge myself. And um, I've enjoyed my regional stint when I was doing placements and stuff like that. But I thought I want to go all out. And they did, they did say, they said, well, how are you going to fill your time? Because obviously once work is done, it's a rural regional setting. People may get bored or burnt out and move away. And I said, well, I've got, a to Z, these things to do after hours. Like when I was studying, I was doing master of public health, master of health management and other things and whatnot and starting a new family. So I think, so they, so they understood that. So I think that's how um, I expressed my interest and I was quite honest and scored the job and, and best decisions of my life. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a pretty interesting role. I mean, you it talks about covering molar, um, uh, root canals, molar, um, extra wisdom teeth extractions, um, pretty much a whole mirage of um, uh, general dentistry. Which uh, I guess in some aspects, when you're in Sydney, a lot of some of those public um, positions don't offer some of that. In fact, you actually got to work with. Dent, other dentists, oral high, um, OHTs, technicians, prosthesis. I think that's a very interesting program. Very multidisciplinary and very useful. And, and we also had the dental van 
which we drove around to nursing homes and aged care centers. And at the same time, there was uh, like you had GA lists every month, I think. So I think every few weeks you had a GA list coming up and then it was a Thursday where we had to go and do that. So I think eye-opening experience and I think it definitely prepared me for the real world, definitely. Mm. Um, you know, of all these CPDs, you've mentioned some of these have been pretty um, influential or high um, impact in your life. So have there been other particular courses um, as well that's uh, CPD or even that's been of great impact in your dentistry? Definitely. So with my interest, which I mentioned, dental public health and whatnot, um, with the online dental webinars which happened, um, not just from Sydney Uni, but obviously Melbourne Uni had one as well, which they promoted and I attended that as well to work out the wait list uh, shortage of dentist problems and other things which they commonly cover. I think they were focusing more on now what the workforce strategy should be and also um, how the system can better align with the private sector. So I think they were eye-opening uh, situations for me where I actually thought, well, I can use this in my career and stuff and whatnot because that's my future trajectory which I want to pursue. Now, keeping those CPDs in mind, these are obviously non-clinical. Now, going on to clinical side of CPDs, which I've done, um, whilst I work in general dental practice, I think you always have to enhance your clinical skills, and that's a given. And I think the way I do it is obviously um, read reviews from different people and contact people who have been in that CPD. Um, I've currently completed uh, part of the Australian Society of Implant Dentistry, the course one and course two. Um, as part of the accreditation program. And then when I do course three and four, I'll be a fellow. Now for that, you've got to do hands-on implant cases and whatnot. So that's something that I want to undertake from the clinical side point as well. Um, I don't want to bottle myself up with CPD completely. So the way I've planned it out is I've done course one and two this year and due to COVID, course three, course three is not happening. This year is happening next year. So I'm doing a few implant cases uh, where I'll be starting from scratch. And then by next year, I'll have my cases ready and then I can do present, then I can do course three, learn some more and present it in course four where you're meant to actually present it to a group. So I think that's one big CP that I've undertaken uh, in the last two years. Because that's been my focus because I thought, well, I want to diversify my clinical skills uh, whilst I'm enhancing my non-clinical aspects as well. Um, the other CPD that I'm sort of interested in at the moment is to look at um, basic hands-on um, surgical extractions because although I do a lot of surgical extractions myself but I think there's obviously it's always good to learn different techniques and methods which are out there which would make your work easy so I think knowledge never goes rusty and that's why um, I want to engage in surgical extraction stuff in terms of CPD learning now as for my goal planning I want to finish my implant stuff implant CPD stuff by next year and then do the surgically extracted stuff towards the latter part of next year. And then the year after, I want to get into sleep medicine kind of things, like just to learn about it and seeing how general dentists can play a part in that. And obviously, if that means, you know, provide, you do, go, doing CPAP stuff or liaising with the sleep technician, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of stuff in that. So I think I want to explore that field the year after. So I've timed myself so that I focus on one CPD at a time and then just basically, yeah, dissolve it in myself <laughs> <laughs> i think that's a good structure to do it like um we've talked with previous guests before as well and they say as well that you know a lot of recent graduates feel like they have to learn orthodontic implants all straight away but it's really coming back down to um learning one properly um as best as you can getting the most out of it as best as you can and then applying it uh, back in practice before you go moving on and then taking on um, other CPD to kind of put it all together. Which is what I'm doing with the implant stuff and it's it's pretty good. I think um, whilst COVID may not be pleasant to the ASID course three, it sort of worked in my favor that I could do my other cases <laughs> and then apply the course three knowledge when it's more fresher to my cases that are in progress and then present it in course four, which is close enough to course three. So I think it sort of worked well in timing for me, even though it was not planned that way. But I, you're right, Lawrence. Um, you learn and then you apply and then you practice and you focus on one thing at a time. That's what my aim is. I'm, I finished in 2016, so you've got 17, 18, 19, and 20. So I'm, 21 was the first year when I started looking at implants. It's my fifth year out. So that was, again, that's the way I had planned myself and that's how I goal planned myself. So I think I'm hitting the targets that way. But I didn't want to overdo a lot of CPD in the first two years. 
Although I did attend the basic 60 credit points norms and trying to work out what the CPD is, that CPD is the local ADA branch CPDs when I was in Victoria as well. So I think that was it was quite good. I mean, they gave you like one hour, two hours of synopsis, be it endodontics or be it restored dentistry. But I think in terms of um, clinical application and where my clinic, where I want my clinical application to head, I've structured it. So I know that I'm going to do these courses in these particular years and keep that year as a focus. Mm. Would there be any particular CP that you feel like you didn't implement or wasn't as beneficial beneficial to you at the time but you, and you would do differently next time? Not really. I've not come across any CPD like that um, because I usually choose the CPD that I want to listen to. For example, last year I signed up for the ADX in-person CPD, which was going to be in, Mel- uh, which was going to be in Sydney, but there was the COVID outbreak there. So they obviously um, put the money on to this year's CPD, which was an online virtual program. So I did that. And that had, a, that had, I think, a collection of various CPD speakers from all over Australia. So I picked and chose the CPD. So I think a couple of CPD, which I really liked, uh, was the restorative one. I think it's something different. Um, Juveneers by Sigal Jacobson, uh, Dr. Sigal Jacobson in Melbourne. So that was really kind of good. Something different, uh, which I wasn't aware of. I'm like, well, there's a technique out there as well if you want to investigate that. Um, and then at the same time, I don't think it was... I wouldn't say there was useless CPD, but I think there was CPD which were, which you can use for a specific time. So I think there was the one where um, they were talking about composite veneers, but with the use of stents and making it very simple with flowable composites. Now, I personally, I know there's a lot of people who do different techniques for composite veneers and there's different things out there. Um, I do them too in my practice, but I think that was something different that I found that this specific German prosthodontist gave a different overview of how to do it. And, it, it. and he made it sound simple. And so if you have a good lab, good sort of knowledge of material, you can do any sort of dentistry. And I think that's what the whole idea is. So I, I mean, although I may not be doing the, that stuff on a daily basis, because my focus would be different um, in, in terms of my patient management, I think it's still useful because I think you may have a one-odd case where you may have to do it. Now, I've had people who actually come up saying, can I get these veneers because of my hypomineralization and there's, obviously staining and, and whitening is not helped and whatnot. Um, I basically did the veneering technique, which I learned online through CPD. And I was like, I'm going to put this cord, I'm going to do this. And and and, and frankly speaking, it was it worked. So I think um, it's definitely applicable, but I think um, you just have to wait for the right patient, right candidate to come. So nothing's wasted, I think. No. Mm. Yeah, you always take away something from um, yeah. any course. So a common term that comes across when we look at when we um, when we look into you is motivational interviewing. So what is it, and how do you implement it to motivate the patient to undertake preventative care? So, for example, and then working in DAPTO as well, and working in Shepherd, and I think a common problem was awareness of what the dentist is saying. So there was lack of dental health literacy, and it would just be maybe the demographic that's coming in. But I thought, well, that's the common problem because yes, I can do like your normal filling and set you home and let you come back for your regular exam and clean. But that defeats the purpose if you're not looking after at home, because I can only be in your mouth for about half an hour at max 45 an hour, but you've got to do your work at home. So if you're not doing your homework, there's some sort of problem. And I think um, to address that, I think I took a tutoring approach and was the fact that usually I used to bring any patient who came for emergency to come back after half an hour, uh, to come back in about a week or two weeks to for a quick review at no cost to them, 15 minutes to 20 minutes, and just basically discuss with them uh, the hygiene habits and obviously um, seeing what they do at home and if they require a general checkup and a clean so that we bring them back and obviously address those concerns and to explain them what we are doing because a lot of people don't understand, didn't understand that. That's what I came across from my experience. So. I thought the best way was motivational interviewing. So making them realize, um, it's, it's a two-way process, making them realize what they're doing and how can they be better at it? Because your oral health is in your hands. I can obviously help you out from my end. I can't really be in your mouth 24 seven, but if I can obviously implement that 1% um, experience from another patient or my experience saying, hey, if you do this, this will be affected, it'll be better for them. So for example, smoking. So a lot of people come there saying, oh, I want to quit smoking, but I can't do it. Now, the ADA has a very good template for smoking cessation. 
I usually go through that and I tell them well, it, it is a difficult task. Um, I understand there'll be reasons, but having said that, um, if you follow this guideline, this protocol, um, and you contact this person, that'd be great. Now, it's not a one-off. Obviously, if that patient is coming back every six months, you reinstate that message. So you reinstate that. Now, obviously, I add that onto my um, regular six-month recalls as well. I mentioned that this person has, I'm focusing on smoking cessation. This person, I need to focus on OHI for this aspect. So I think that works really well. Now, with the patients that I've seen, now, again, my study of 10, because <laughs> I was keeping tabs on some patients, some critical patients, I would say three or four have actually stopped smoking. So, and that's over the three years. Now, it is a tough process. Um, obviously, being re I've referred them to different different um, agencies as well, in which which have prescribed the guideline. Um, but I feel that if I can make the difference over here, because they say you've got to be constant about smoking cessation, it's good. So I think implementing that motivational interviewing approach, where the person reflects on what they're doing, how you can help them out, and what outcomes you can have what other treatment options you can have and whatnot. I think it'll make them reflect. Now, it may not be an instant effect. It's over, over the time. So I think that's what I want to implement. And that's just one example. We've had like someone come in for oral hygiene instruction as well, where they've actually been concerned that the mouth smells, mouth smells, mouth smells. And I think I think I nutted down to different, different reasons and whatnot. And then ultimately, I think it was a couple of dietary things that they had to change. Because obviously, if there's no decay, there's no gum disease and your gut is fine, medically you're fit and fine, then there's obviously something that's causing it. And I think that also had a good implementation effect overall. So long story short, um, I sort of enjoy that aspect um, because I see that you're not just a dental surgeon, you're also an oral physician because I think a lot of people say I'm a dental surgeon, they forget that it's not just clinical dentistry. There's obviously that aspect that you are actually trying to change uh, into a healthy habit for the patient. And I think the way you do it is one of the tactics is motivational interviewing. Mm, yeah, I think it's, I think it's, um, I've heard this before about how, um, yeah, you might not see the ROI in, you know, encouraging people to quit smoking, but at, at maybe a particular point, um, you might actually be able to capture that person at a moment where they are thinking about it. And it's at that moment, if you ask it, that it actually encourages them or reinforces it to them to actually think about it again. Correct. Yes. So you've, I must pivot here a little bit. We talked about mentoring a little bit. You know, you've talked about it in the past, the value of mentoring, you know, the helping hand. Many graduates look for mentoring when they're at interviews now. What are your tips when it comes to mentoring and uh, mentor finding in your early clinical years? It, so I think it may not necessarily be a clinical or on the job mentor. You can have a mentor at university as well. And I've had someone who is from, the Faculty of Science at Sydney University has been a mentor since I've started my university career till now. So I think um, it depends on what you're trying to gain out of it. So, and what you're trying to give back as well. So I feel that with with my mentor, he's been my career guider, my personal life guider, where I've got any sort of questions I can ask him. So that gentleman's still there at Sydney Uni. I still speak to him every now and then. It's been pretty good. Now, if I go on to the dental school, I've had three mentors in a sense, lecturers who I'm still in touch with. That's the best free CPD and best free resource you would ever have if you're ever in problem, even in your daily work life. And it's, even in second year out, when I was struggling with something, I just rung my lecturer and uh, my pros lecturer. And I'm like, look, I've done this. I've done this. I'm encountering this problem. It's happened twice. This denture is seeming loose. <laughs> what am I doing wrong or what can I do better? Um, and then he just gave me a helping hand. So on the phone, pretty good. So I think I've had those three mentors during dental school as well, where I can bounce off ideas if I'm, when I'm making mistakes and they can carry on through to your professional life as well. Um, when you're at work and your first first few jobs or first job, first year out for sure, um, if you've got a mentor or a support system, that's very good because you can bounce off cases because you're 100% independent and you want to reflect on where you can do things better and differently. They mean, it's not more of a criticism thing, but it's more so just trying to understand the constructive feedback because there may be different ways to approach the same problem, probably an easier method out there. And I think where possible make things easy. So I think that's what I found. That's where I found mentoring quite beneficial. When I was in Shepherd and I had a clinical mentor, 
but I also had a mentor through the mentoring program, which the ADA Victorian branch held. So we used to have mentor meetings with the Victorian branch uh, allocated mentor as well. And I used to drive to Melbourne every few weeks to catch up with her. And she was nice. She used to work in public and private sectors and, and I could discuss um, outside clinical issues with her, even clinical issues with her from her perspective. And that was really good. At work, I had uh, my mentor, my boss, who basically I used to discuss different issues saying, um, look, I'm doing this um, U upper URA for a child, trying to work out um, how would this work, where should I do this and whatnot, because there's different approaches to do it. So I think that was fantastic. I think it's very important if you've got a mentor and if you haven't had the opportunity to find one, definitely when you're looking for work, try and see if the gentleman or the lady, like, or the professor or whoever you're working under or with, um, they can actually supervise you, not all supervising, like constantly, but in, in the sense that if you have a lunch break, you want to talk to them and bounce off ideas and supervision in that way that they can actually see your work and be like, hey, look, this is great. Why don't you do this differently and get another approach? And I wouldn't be looking for a micromanager, obviously, because that may demotivate some individuals, but I think someone who can actually add to your knowledge. And 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 if, if, if that be it, it'd be the fact that you're looking at someone who encourages you to do things differently and do different procedures and stretches to your limit, basically. Um, I found that in public, you have a lot of mentors because there's a lot of uh, dentists out there, senior dentists out there who would be, uh, help, who'd be helping uh, to help you out there as well and pitching you as well, pitching for you rather. Um, in, in the practice where, I, in the hospital where I was, we had, um, well, I think there was two senior dentists, well, two years out compared to us who were out there. And there was the um, main boss who was the uh, clinical director for the area. So he was my direct mentor and he was working as well. So whenever I was getting stuck with a procedure or I felt that, look, I didn't do this effectively, I spent more time on this, how could I improve? He used to come and say, hey, do that. And funnily in Golden Valley Hill, we had our rooms as graduates had these windows and the mentor was working beside, so he used to always look at us. <laughs> <laughs> so he was constantly looking at us. And I know once he was saying, he was like, this. <laughs> and then, so literally what he was saying, so he was, so the patient couldn't see, but I could see and I'm like, oh, okay, oh, this tool, fair enough. We didn't know we had this tool. So, so I think it was very good. And I think that's how I enhanced my experience. So I think it was, so I think it's been a combination in terms of mentors outside and mentors inside. And I think when you're going out for your first job, um, it's a fair question when they, when they do ask you, oh, do you have any other questions for us? Just say, um, is there a possibility of uh, getting mentored? What I mean, and then explain what do you mean by mentored? So just say mentored in the sense, not direct supervision on I, because that's same as university, rather someone to bounce off cases and ideas and work out if there's any patient problems or clinical problems which you may encounter. And most people will be quite receptive to it. And I think my friends went into private dentistry. They had, they, they found senior dentists out. They were quite willing to help out as well. So, so I think there's mentors everywhere. But for me, I thought public was my starting point and I found a good one there. Mm. Yeah, look, uh, for some of our audio listeners, uh, what Mohit was doing, he was throwing, throwing his hands in the air and uh, <laughs> giving funny facial expressions that you probably won't be able to see unless you were watching the visual, um, the video version. Um, what I really liked was the fact that what you talked about was that you were talking about these mentors you um, had access to back from uni. You know, a lot of people, when they graduate, they just move out or they come back to a different state or their home state and they think they've lost all their um, connections back. Uh, but like you've just said, you still got, you moved interstate, but you still kept those contacts from university. And even it, whether it be your tutors, sometimes your tutors might be, um, undergrad uh postgraduate students um that are going on to graduate and they will come out into this um private world or public world where you will interact with them and you can lean on them for advice as well so um i think that's a really good point for a lot of people who feel like they don't have these connections on you know oh, i've lost all of it but really um, even at a student level there are there my previous head of school um, and there was a change when I was leaving as well. There was a new head of school then. Um, my previous head of school, I'm still in contact with him and he's moved to University of Maryland, Baltimore in the US. 
and I'm still in touch with him. And the thing is, it's good to always keep your networks open and keep contact with your ref with your mentors because they can also be an, an amazing referee for you depending on where you go because they've seen your work firsthand. They know what your goals and interests are and they can articulate that better, better than anyone else when you're applying for jobs. Mm. Your, I, I know a big mentor of you has been Dr. Uh, Dr. Brent Mc... Um, I'm going to say this wrong. <laughs> Mc... Mapalant, yes. And, you know, you said that if you ever have doubts about what you're doing, close your eyes and ask yourself, am I doing the right thing? And if the answer is yes, you should go for it. What are your thoughts on dentists interested in community volunteering or leadership? I think every opportunity is gold. And whilst timing may be an issue for a lot of dentists where they may not want to get involved or can't get involved because of extra reasons and stuff, personal reasons or commitment reasons, I think... It's never too late, and there's all you can always make some time. Now, you may not you may not necessarily want to join an organization to be part of delivering services. You can do it firsthand through your own house, and that could be in the practice you're at or whatnot. And that's how I started when I was doing it in Dapto, and 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 that got appreciated, recognized, and I think with the ADA, we're trying to do other things as well. So I think the idea is. There's all you can always do it small scale. You don't have to go all out and 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 big. But I feel that a lot of people are hesitant in taking that step because they feel that now they are committed to it, they are bound to it, and it'll cut down on their clinical dentistry, it'll impact on their personal life, it'll take extra hours, which I don't see that as a problem. I feel that it's more so how you structure your books, how you structure your times so that you can balance your personal and professional life with extracurriculars. And, and you don't need to be linked to an organization to do it. You can, if you want to, there's opportunities out there with tons of organizations, as I mentioned, through the ADA, they put up fantastic, fantastic opportunities out there. But I feel that for me, I started it in-house and then I branched out with local community groups and then did it at my own pace, which was suitable to me. And that worked really well. Um, Dr. McParland is the mentor, which I have from Sydney University, which is still there. And, and I think each time when we speak different, different things, we speak about what I'm doing and how he's doing and whatnot. And, and, and when, we, when I mentioned my career trajectory, I'm saying, hey, I'm doing this course. This is what my interests are. Um, that's where I'm going on to. He all, and, he, and in the past, he used to always say that, are you sure about it? You know, if you, if you think you're doing the right thing, go for it, close your eyes. You'll know that you're doing the right thing. And, and, and that's resonated with me, and that's what I always do. I'm like, well, okay, if I'm pursuing this pathway, I want to engage in this fully, and my heart is giving me the, my, the green light, so why not pursue this more and more? So I think always reflect on where you, what you want to achieve and what you want to give. So with the projects I wanted to achieve was the fact that trying to gauge people's knowledge about um, dental health and, and awareness, and that's what I found. It was quite lacking in the areas I was. There was low dental health literacy. And the outcomes which I wanted to achieve was obviously people uptaking dental treatment. Now, it may not be seeing me, but just see someone. And I think the way I engaged was obviously engage in referral pathways for these patients who were coming in for free consultations through various agencies, be it the local AMS, be it, uh, be it the um, local public dental health clinic where they could be going through the voucher system or through another system out there which would be more approachable. So I think that was quite fantastic because I think you strengthen the bridge between private and public dentistry. It removes the fear barrier, it removes the cost barrier. And I think it sort of um, unmasks the real dentist in that we are not just money hungry people. There's, we, we genuinely are concerned because the last thing I want to do is see patients in and out and just pulling teeth out because that is not my goal. My goal is obviously trying to treat the patient, but at the same time, learn from them what their concern is so that we are part of this journey together because your health is your, your dental health is part of your general health. So I think if you understand that concept, you will, you will appreciate that more, that, that it's part of your body and you look after it more. But to have that sort of linkage, you need to speak to someone about it. And if you don't know there's linkage there, well, how are you gonna do it? So the best way to do it was through the pro bono programs that I'm part of. Now, to answer your question specifically, how can other dentists and young dentists get involved in um, various community projects? Well, work out how much time you have on, on board. Is it one hour per month, two hours per month, or one hour per week, 
or can you donate time like you know maybe three weeks at a stretch at the end of the year depends on that i do the i do the volunteer dental officer thing with the royal flying doctor service at my own pace and at their pace depending on when i speak to them and then i do it every three three and a half four months um so i space it out basically and it's been fine it's been good but that's that's when i schedule my books that way that's my interest now some people may be happy to do it two weeks at a stretch so it just depends on the opportunities out there and the timing commitments but i haven't linked myself onto any organizations i do things as i feel the need to and they where the issues lie basically mm, i love that i love that um you know for someone from yourself you know you're talking about a lot of people ask about you know work-life balance and you've just talked about it just then it's just about reevaluating your own situation and just working out um you don't have to do something big you can just be little small little things that you're helping out you're doing along the way and then you know once that opportunity arises then take on that opportunity to take on a bigger project but you don't have to feel like it has to be a big chunk right now because you might not be in that situation correct um yeah have there been any particular struggles in your cpd journey or dental journey that some of us might not know about I think um, in it, I would say initially when I started out um, in my first year out, I used to see a lot of friends and people posting up various CPDs they were attending and some were doing high end orthodontics, you know, <laughs> six months out, which is fantastic. It's, it's quite uh, commendable. And there were some who were basically trying to work out or if I can put that implant in straight away. My tip which I thought was useful for me. And I think one of my mentors at Griffith University told me was to get the bread butter dentistry right. If I can't make bread butter, I can't go and make, cook a big, you know, holistic pasta. I can't cook master chef kind of dishes. So I think the aim was to obviously do simple stuff first and then probably build on the experience because then I'll know how to diagnose the problem if there's a problem at that level. But it could be a simple problem. Um, now, in terms of the struggle, where I found struggle through this was the fact that there was a lot of peer pressure. A lot of peers used to say, why don't you join with my CPD course or we get a good deal or a discount. And, 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 and it's easy to get swayed where you've got friends who are, who are actually trying to help you out and trying to do it together just to bolster their own motivation as well, is to go and do these courses and whatnot. But I think what I found was some of these courses were very expensive and, so, and they were very time consuming. And they weren't in alignment with my interest then, even though some, some of the courses I might do them now, but I feel that it depends on the time, right point, right time for the effect to take place. So I think that was a struggle uh, in the sense that trying to prioritize what's needed now versus what can I leave it for later and depending on which industry I enter. When I was in public dental health, obviously we didn't do implants there. So I was like, I'm not gonna focus on implants and orthodontics now, I do, I'll do, the things that apply to me, which I did, like clinical governance, other things and whatnot. When I went to private dentistry, um, I, I thought, well, my patients are saying, can you do implants? Can you do implants? Well, for them, I'm going to do it because there's a demand there. So I think I work with a demand approach. Wherever there's a demand for something, I'm going to do it. I'm not just going to get a whole list of skills for myself and just um, not use them. So I think wherever there's a demand, I've just made a list that this patient wants this. So, okay, I'm going to tackle sleep medicine in two years time, this next year, basically. So I'm gonna keep a focus like that. The struggle, I think the struggling period was initially where it was hard to tell some friends that I can't do this course and and this course may not be what I'm wanting to do. So I think it's one of those things that you come into a decision-making kerfuffle where like, should I do this course? Is it for me? Because everyone's going and doing it. Should I do this course and just jump in and do it and increase the debt, which I already have from dental school. <laughs> So I think it's it's I think that's where the struggling comes. The first two years of outside dental school, we're trying to find your feet and do the best you can. And by all means, if you want to do it, do it. But at the same time, see if there's a demand, because you obviously need a good return on investment on the CPD. And frankly speaking, if you're just doing it for the sake of it, there will be no benefit because you're not going to enjoy it. You spend that much money, what are you getting out of it? So yeah.
Mm. Dr. Mahit, there's so many questions I want to ask you, but you know, I love your passion for you know the community side of public health dentistry, all the things you've done to change you know the healthcare system, indigenous students' education, multicultural enrichment. So many questions I want to ask you, but you know that's all the time we've got for today. Um, can you tell our viewers how they can find you and you know what's kind of going on in your life at the moment outside of maybe COVID? Uh, outside COVID, I think I'm. Uh, like what do you say a home manager <laughs> looking after <laughs> my three-year-old son and whilst wife is working and doing all the housework so I think I think the basic routine I guess uh, cooking cleaning and other stuff um, <laughs> but at the same time um, outside COVID what I'm doing well we have COVID's everywhere so I would say during this pandemic what I'm doing I'm trying to finish off a master of dental public health specializing in dental public health just out of interest in the because I've thought that it's the best way to cement everything from a dental perspective and more localized perspective so that's what i'm doing trying to fill my time with study whilst we can um yes even though i'm working during the pandemic with urgent emergency care there is that time which i can utilize to study and what better than actually end up with a degree <laughs> during this pandemic so I, that, that's what i'm doing in terms of extracurriculars but uh, but other than that just family management Mm, I love that. Um, so for all our viewers, if you like this episode, drop a comment below on your favorite part. Uh, but don't forget to like and subscribe. For our listeners, if you like this episode, leave a review as well. And don't forget to share it with your friends. And we'll see you in the next episode of CPD Junkie Podcast.